everyone, welcome to eLearn Chat, where you always learn something new. I'm Rick Zanotti, and today I am joined by Harold Mugliotti. And we've got a very special guest, a very good friend of mine, somebody we all love, respect, and I do another show with her too called Life Edge. You'll meet her in a moment. Here we go. This show is sponsored by Relate Corporation at www.relate.com. Your training and video partner. Hello, I'm Peter Baker. Please visit voiceovermasterclass.com to see details of the training courses I have on offer for new and existing voice talents to further their career by enhancing voice and technical skills as well as essential marketing tips. And we are back and joining us in that center position of power. She is powerful. <laughs> We've got with us Dr. Susan Nash. She is the Director of Training for the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Uh, she's a professor at University of Oklahoma, and she does a million things. She's a writer. She's written lots of books and articles and this and that. She's prolific. I don't think she sleeps more than an hour a day. Do you? <laughs> How are you doing, Susan? Um, good, and I'm glad to be here. And I've been thinking about changing times and flexibility, and and the really the importance of e-learning and all this. Yeah, and things are changing. Boy, are we changing! You know, in in the other show we do, we've been talking a lot about the coronavirus and its effect on, if nothing else, its fearful effect on things right now. But there's a lot of doctors who are predicting it will spread, and it's probably going to spread through most of the world at one point, and it may take out as many as 2% of those who get it, maybe more, which is a pretty high percentage. That's higher than, uh, is it higher than a flu? Probably. Um, but they said most people won't get it. If you're, if you're healthy enough and you stay clear of it and you have a good immune system, you probably won't get affected. But it's affecting travel worldwide right now. And that means training travel. I wonder, mm -hmm. uh, I know we work with one very large uh, multinational, it, it's a big financial company, and anybody traveling right now has to report in where they're going, where they've been, uh, so they're they, to a crisis management team. They're, they're taking this very seriously, and so are many other companies with travel requirements, especially travel to Asia. Um, have you seen or heard of any of that happening right now? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, at, um, at work here at AAPG, we, we had a, a, a notice yesterday. We talked about, okay, let's plan for potential disruptions. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get everybody able to make sure that everybody has connection from home so that if they're quarantined or self-isolating, they can uh, from home. And also, that we've noticed that there have been quite a few travel bans right mm. now. Uh, re do not travel to South Korea, I think it's Japan, Italy, and of mm. course, China. Yeah, it, and, it and so that. what, yeah, so what that's it's leading to is, is the necessity to communicate and, and, and not, not break commerce because no. We've talked about many times that in the overall scheme of things, panic and economic collapse will kill many more people than than any virus. Right. And we're already feeling it. Stock markets around the world are reeling a little bit. The U.S. had a couple of down days, but I think brought it back up yesterday. I, I haven't seen what the results were today. Uh, but that's that's, uh, that's the emotional market. That's people freaking out, panicking and... Uh, you know, the institutional investors know what they're doing. The individual ones are just panicking. Um, so we're having some of that. It's mm -hmm. also a lot of, oh, no, I didn't need to jump in, but I just wanted to say it's a lot of um, the computerized programming Yes. where they have automatic <laughs> sell. Yeah. And we're going to see issues with retail because the supply chain isn't able to fulfill orders right now. Uh, we're going to see car parts diminish. You're going to have more problems getting repairs, more expensive repairs. Uh, places like Best Buy and others are going to not be able to get enough electronics in. Computer repairs are starting to see the problem. It's been about a month now, and they're starting to see parts not coming in. 
Uh, Diet Coke. If you're a Diet Coke drinker, they're not going to be making much soon because one of the major products or ingredients comes from China. Hello. So I'd say the world has stupidly put everything into one place, and now there's no other place to get products. It's not smart. Uh, but this may change things a little bit because we're going to have to have parallel to mark, you know, <coughs> excuse me, manufacturing because this is going to kill the whole economy of a lot of places. And China's reeling right now because it's killing them the most. Uh, exactly. They've got millions of companies, little companies, which feed the bigger companies, part of the supply chain. They're not getting products in. Well, right. And so, so I was doing some research. So 30, only 28% of the world's finished goods are, are manufactured in China hmm. only. Only. Oh. Oh, I think we lost Susan for a second. Uh, yeah. Looks like she got disconnected here. Let's see if she connects back. Here we are. We are live, folks. Sometimes this happens. So as soon as she gets back in, we'll continue. <laughs> oh, well. There that, you are. That's weird. <laughs> My computer went on sleep. Well, that's strange. First time I said oh, that. That's funny. <laughs> Okay. Well, we're actually. Anyway, uh, well, you were uh, saying 20, only twenty eight percent of the manufacturing is from China. Yes, only twenty eight percent. However, however, when you go and look at Mexico and their manufacturing, or Vietnam, or others, what you find is that um, that they require inputs from mm. China. So, so if you look at Apparently, ninety-seven percent of the world's manufacturing. Hmm. Sure, good. Yeah, I think we lost you again. Oh, a little bit. You're right. Here so, you I know, am. Cut out just a bit. So you were uh, saying ninety-seven percent of the inputs are coming from China. Ninety-seven. No, ninety-seven percent of the world's goods have at least one input mm. from China. And that's a lot. Now, I'm not saying that they may have a second supply source, mm -hmm. but... <laughs> For some things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Now, moving on to more joyful subjects before our imminent demise to the, to the virus. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what trends are you seeing in training right now? Okay, well... So, for example, I mean, and again, not to, we're creating two contingency plans. So, for example, I'm going to offer a course on using Excel and doing to instead of um, Python mm -hmm. for creating random forest algorithms, machine learning. Oh. And it's used for um, randomness and 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 um, risk and also different simulations etc so yeah so instead of using python a lot of companies don't won't let their their um, um, employees download the download the, the code right. for, or the program or jupyter notebook which is the environment or r <laughs> so so then so they, it's, here's a way to actually get around that and use what is commonly used. And plus, you don't have to worry about the format of the, the data. So, we, so we're going to have it face-to-face -face for two days. But I thought, you know, if people can't travel, why don't we do something where I've done this before when we couldn't travel. It just went ahead and did um, go to meeting or Zoom mm -hmm. simultaneously and then opened up the, 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 the share the desktop and then basically did everything together for the people who were there and also the people who are, who are joining in remotely. And then for the remote attendees and everything, we'd have some asynchronous homework and, and coaching. Yeah. And that could so work a, easily, yeah. Yeah, so it's an easy, easy fix. And if, especially if you don't have time to build an entire online course. Yeah, so I imagine uh, that, especially in situations like we've got with, with pandemics or anything else, that'd be a, a more realistic way of trying to not drop the training, but get people still involved. 
Exactly. Yeah, in fact, I know that um, another another situation, people are scrambling to figure out how to get keep their schools, um, at least even if they're closed physically, to keep the courses going and classes going. Right. So they're they're doing that <laughs> with um, K through twelve. And by the way, the the COVID virus currently, the COVID nineteen, that one isn't really affecting young people primarily over fifty. Interestingly enough, huh? I didn't didn't know it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know, but they're closing schools nonetheless. They are just to be safe. So yeah, I'm not too familiar with it. How much? How how big is distance learning currently in the K to twelve? Like, is that something that a lot of schools already sort of has set up, or is that something that they're having to? Implement? I think a lot of them have more like hybrid. But I, there are entire schools that are K through 12 that are, are almost like alternative schools. Yeah. So I know that Oklahoma has this where, where somebody can choose to go through it. And it's, they don't pay anything extra. It's free. And uh, it's public. And, the, and also the teachers who are in Oklahoma teachers can teach. And um, I had a coworker who was a teacher who kind of burned out after one year. <laughs> but mm. she loved teaching. So she was able to, to teach online, mm -hmm. and she, she loved it. So okay. is what they're doing kind of a proctored approach? They have a, a teacher in the room, but the kids are learning on their own? Um, I think that there are, they have like every hour, they'll have a um, certain number of, of minutes of, of joint presentation, and they okay. go in and they join the room, and then they have activities, and then they come back. Then they go on their own, they have activities, and they come back. Now, Susan, would you agree to this that, okay, uh, let me post it a different way. Do you think that school, especially for young kids, is boring? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, not? <laughs> and do you think they teach at the speed of a snail? <laughs> of course, they have to. Yeah. I, I remember as a kid, I was bored out of my wits at school. Uh, the reading was very slow. The, the teaching was always at the lowest common denominator, which was maybe one or two of the kids in the class who had some problems, and everybody else was sitting there half, half zombie-like. And it just was the most boring thing. It was, you know, f how many hours were we in school? Eight, uh, about eight hours of our day or seven hours just sitting there listening. Very boring. Um, now... When I went to I went to Catholic school uh, for about uh, probably about six years, and that was a little better. There was still a lot of lecture, but we actually did have hands-on with a lot of different whether it was science or other things. We we had more hands-on as far as doing things. But I remember going back to public school for high school, and it was like, oh God. Everything in high school we had learned in, in junior, and actually in, in elementary school, in Catholic school. So we were, so high school here in LA, when, I, when we moved out, it was four years behind a Catholic school through eighth grade. And I was going, that's really sucky. Oh, I sucky. can believe that. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. So we're <laughs> sitting there, you know, I hate to admit it, but I ditched probably 75% of the time in school because there was nothing to do there. I still got good grades. And, and you go, <laughs> that's so wrong. That's just so wrong. Um, well, but you know, just, the, yeah. my experience was completely different because I was really, you know, I don't know. I was involved in a lot of different activities. But then when I got to 11th grade, they had decided to have middle schools and high school. And, mm. and they got really <laughs> experimental. And they said, okay, we're going to prepare you for college or real life. And you'll have classes twice a week or three times a week, just like a college class. And you can go at your own pace if you want to go mm faster you can so boy i just charged through stuff because i had like no friends and and i felt happy <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's the problem being a smart girl right <laughs> yeah so i worked through two years of typing in one year and three three years of latin in two years and two years of chemistry in one you just on and on and got to do um calculus and all that stuff so i was like super super like um full of full of self-confidence when I went yeah. to OU and man slammed against the wall because what I found <laughs> there 
<laughs> I found that they were all about rote lit memorization in those mm. early classes. Really, like, so, yeah, really so, so the university was actually much further behind than the more experimental school. It was horrible. I should have gone to a small school. <laughs> You know, I, I that's said, so I sad. Said it's it's so <laughs> sad because you're the perfect example. You're smart, and, and given the ability to run ahead, you run ahead. You just <laughs> you do it because one, you're motivated, and two, like I'm done. I don't have to do this anymore. Isn't that great? And you do well. And well, here's the craziest thing. I worked through four years of high school Spanish in one semester. <laughs> oh, I believe it. Yeah, but I because, studied on my own the summer before. <laughs> okay. No, but in school, I remember when I was in elementary and, and high school, I took French, I, I, I took Japanese. Those, those are the two languages I took. And it was so slow. It, it's like, no. I mean, you, you learned like basic. You didn't even learn how to ask for where the bathroom is in your first, I mean, that's important. And, you know, nothing, nothing important, just hello, how are you, where are you, where am I? It's like, oh, my gosh. And it took forever. <laughs> And so if you had any motivation in learning language, it was killed by the first semester. Um, well, and also my mother spoke Spanish, so that helped. <laughs> that does help. Yeah, my parents spoke Spanish. That's why I didn't take Spanish at school, because my parents spoke at home. But it was just one of those things that I, I remember school was just slow. And so when, when I got into college, any, or even in high school, I would take every hard class I could find in either summer school Actually, usually summer school, because when I was in college, for the first part, it was the semester system. I hated semester. 20 weeks of a lousy class was really torture. But, you know, yeah. when you got at least in, in the quarter system, it was only 10 weeks. That's not that bad. It was at least bearable. But, you know, I just look at school as it's so slow. At least in corporate America, they tend to teach you quickly. Tend mm -hmm. to. Not always. But yeah. so you have to get up and running so you can get to work. And I really prefer that approach. Get somebody going fast, and then you worry about details later on, you know, especially more advanced things. But I just think that school is like the most anti-educational thing put on earth because it's not there to motivate kids to do much of anything. I love what they, what they did with you with that you know, experimental thing. And for people like you, it succeeded. What about the people who couldn't keep up? Would they just go slower and it was okay? Uh, they they just passed them and they they talked about how what a great time they had and when we have um, when we have our class reunions people just talk about how they were in a drug drugged out fog that whole mm. time oh, and so oh. like I wasn't I never did that yeah <laughs> interesting but Harold I have a question for you okay so what I found and I found in in training is that you start with a problem and it, you have to solve it. Yeah. And so then it's and then you've got to use your prior knowledge and and you know where you are wh where to get resources. And that to me works. But have you had that experience, Harold? Well, where you you basically start you have you you're given a problem and then you you have the the training but it's the end at the end of the day you've got to to solve that problem. Yeah, like, I mean, like, like supply chain. Let's say you're learning, you're taking a cl class in su supply chain, but mm -hmm. you're you're taking it because we have an issue right now. Mm -hmm. So there's that sense of urgency. I mean, that seems like a good way to go about things because I, I guess when you actually come across prob problems, not in training but in the real world, then it's not going to be quite what you've encountered before necessarily and it's not going to be quite what people have told you how to handle before it's going to be something where you have to synthesize the skills that you've gotten before in a new way probably and put it together and come up with with a solution exactly. that you may you don't quite know will work but you have a pretty good idea based on other things now susan what you asked is interesting too because it brings up the concept of experimentation but it also brings brings up the concept of not being a not being afraid to try several things but here's one thing i i've, I've noticed with with meetings today for example in, in in this is in corporations 
when when I was growing up, and probably you too, to a certain point, you know, we're we're close in age. Um, mm -hmm. We were taught that if you're going to brainstorm, you're going to have different energies in that brainstorming session. You're going to have the people who agree. You're also going to have a devil's advocate in there, usually trying to knock it down, making the person trying to push the idea through have to fight a little bit to protect it, to explain it, to to defend the idea and its merits. Well, today, everybody's just around going, oh, yeah, that's great. What do you mean it's great? It was a stupid <laughs> idea. I mean, why are we saying it's great to something completely moronic? And we are. It's like, no, let's come up with an yeah. idea that works. Not all ideas are good and not all solutions are good, but we just, oh, yeah, that's good. That's great. Let's do it. No. <laughs> um, and I hear this all the time. I've been in enough board meetings and even the boardrooms you hear this. And I've been in enough meetings and, and with upper level management or even middle management all going, I, we think that's great. Uh, did you just hear what the person recommended? Let's take a step back. So I used to be the devil's adv advocate a lot because I would say, no, wait, wait. Let's take a step back and think about this before we all agree on doing something like, you know, we're just going to go over the cliff and isn't that fun? It, it, and so we have this, let's kumbaya, everything is great mentality. And when it fails, all the fingers stop pointing at each other. It's like, no, you know, no, the point of fingers would point right at each at themselves for agreeing to this without any argument. Um, there's a lot of that going on. Now you call it, call it politically correct meetings, if you will. But when we're trying to find solutions to something, there are good solutions, there are mediocre solutions, and there are downright stupid solutions. And more often than not, we wind up going stupid because it's easy and nobody gets offended and nobody's this and nobody's that. But as a result, we have either a bad solution or no solution. Well, what do you think of that? Well, okay, in the oil industry, I say that a lot of times people will propose all kinds of solutions and people think, hmm, yeah, sure, sure, sure. It'll never get implemented hmm. because there's never been a place to like people feel comfortable about trying that innovation. Hmm. And, and there aren't enough companies. Like there's a whole... The whole sub-level of industry of people who work in technology and innovation facilitation. And, and that involves a lot of training and, and, and knowledge transfer. But, but mainly it, it tr requires a lot of communication between, um, for example, a, a company that may want to try to, to compress the emissions from their natural gas well instead of flaring them. They'll say, well, we'll try this, we'll try this, but they don't ever get around to putting it out mm. in the real world. So <laughs> there have to be a number of companies who are willing to take out a little part of their operations and use it as their living laboratory. Well, and I, I wonder, you know, it, I think it is true that in a meeting situation where people are pitching I ideas and people are just going to say whether is this an okay idea or not, then a lot of people will just say, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. But what happens when you try to take this and, and you pit it against other things that this may take resources away from and, and other ideas and you tell people to prioritize them, do they give you a different answer? Good point. Good point. Yeah, if you're messing with somebody's dog bowl or if yeah. you're asking somebody to pay for it. <laughs> I like that. Don't mess with anybody's dog bowl. <laughs> um, now, you know, here's another thing, and let's bring it down to the elemental level. When you cook something, you need fire. If there's no fire, nothing will ever get cooked. Yeah. And if an idea has no fire either behind it or trying to get it through it, it'll never be that good probably because nothing's cooking it. And that's kind of yeah. the elemental idea of brainstorming or something. You, know, you need some fire to really you know, get that brain going, get the ideas coming out. And... and whether someone has a lot of experience or doesn't have a lot of experience, they can still make the same level of mistake if they're not challenged to be a little bit better or to think of the possibilities or the ramifications, the permutations, all the things that could go wrong or that could go right. You know, it's like a lot of times we think of things as if we do this, here's the outcome. Isn't that great? Well, yeah, but what happens if all those things go wrong? Oh, 
Well, we don't like to dwell on that. I, I had a doctor once. Uh, well, I knew him. He was a, an eye surgeon. And when he did surgery, he would never tell anybody that there's a possibility of anything going wrong. So when something went wrong, people would say, hey, you, you didn't tell me that might happen. Well, I didn't want to worry you. So on the one hand, yes, they weren't worried about the surgery, but the result got them very un unhappy. So how do you balance the not worrying about a surgery with the reality of what could happen, which they weren't prepared for? So that's the kind of thing you know, we're talking about. So many things are at stake, depending on what we're doing, uh, that if we're not cooking the ideas well, we may run into a situation where it, we put out ideas that aren't good and nobody's... W I'll, I'll give an example. Look at, look at the average website today. <coughs> They're unreadable. Light gray text on white backgrounds or bl light blue gray on white back. Very, very hard to read. No contrast combinations. Nobody says anything. I, I talk to people all the time. They're always complaining they can't read something. Well, have you complained to anybody? Well, no. Uh, and people in companies don't ever complain much past who they report to. And those people don't, and as the further up you go, the less complaining you hear at the high end because nobody wants to say anything. So if you look at a corporate website, whether it's a big corporation or a small one, and you find that and nobody can read it, and in fact, if you show it to maybe one of the senior VPs or directors or managers, they go, wow, this, this really sucks. Why, why is that happening? Well, it's your website. Well, I don't know. I don't know why we did this. Nobody checks and nobody says anything. So it, across a whole corporation, things get lost. Uh, there was a case at Cedar sinai Hospital, a very large hospital in Los Angeles. Um, this is years ago, and it was, it was cited in a book called Systematics, a, a book about systems and how they fail and how they don't do well. And he goes, in a system, here we had one hospital, a very large hospital, that put out 10,000 invoices all for one penny each, and no one caught it except the customers wow. who started complaining and they all went, oops, it was a computer glitch. No one, no one from the people printing it to stuffing it to looking at balances even caught it. And then eventually it gets to the end users, the clients, and everybody's ticked off. Why am I getting one penny invoice? Or they're getting dunning notices because they haven't paid what they owe because they only got a one penny invoice and they sent in a penny. <laughs> it's like, you know, so this was a system snafu and nobody along the chain did anything about it. And, and that's the same thing we were talking about, whether it's your brainstorming or whatever you're doing. If everybody has the mentality of, oh, that's great nothing gets done nothing ever really but, succeeds or at well, best yeah. it'll be mediocre i think the other thing that happens in the case of of um putting together ideas or programs sometimes it's all just about compliance mm, yeah. and it's not about engagement and so i've i've noticed many many different e-learning programs that are very careful Mm -hmm. to check the boxes so they have this, the right kind of learning outcomes to yeah. to to be uh, to get accreditation here or there. Mm -hmm. And and so people are so terrified of deviating from that, they don't think about if it actually works, if it actually yeah. engages the learner, or if there's some opportunity to uh, collaborate and, and do something with the, the knowledge later. That That's a good point. That's a really good point. And it's just interesting. It's just an interesting world we live in today because nobody can say much. And, and when they do, you have to be careful. And, and when you're building things or putting things together, if everybody agrees, that's not always good. Now, mind you, there are different kind of companies that will probably push it more or whatever and not just do it because they can do it or train because they can. If you look at a lot of companies, training is again, the lowest common denominator, trying to keep it simple, plain, not ruffle any feathers, no matter what you're saying. And everybody can complain about anything. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. We worked with a very large utility company and we did a lot of OSHA training for them. And at one point we had this character called uh, Fred Fall Apart. Fred's a mess, everything's broken on Fred. He's in a test tube 
And we had Dr. Strain. Dr. Strain was this German doctor. He looked like Freud, actually. But he was, uh, he was actually had a Germanish accent. And he's got Fred going, oh, Freddie, I don't know what to do with you. Let me think. Uh, and then you had to click all over Freddie's body to find out what was wrong with him. He was a mess. <laughs> and after that, that WBT we did ran 10 years. 10 years. And every two years, they had to take it for compliance. It was all about ergonomics. <laughs> And, and, and repetitive stress disorders and everything else. Oh, nice. One person complained and said, Dr. Strain is a Nazi and he's anti-Semitic. And they took what? the course down. Because they thought Freddie Fall Apart they thought was, a, Freddy was, Fall a Apart Jewish was a poor victim in a concentration <laughs> camp. Oh, wow. And, and this is like, really? And, and they actually complained and it got taken down. And I was thinking, my gosh, I mean, people go nuts on something that, I mean, that's a real far stretch. It was, and it was kind of done in a, in, a, in a slightly funny, kind of ironic manner. It wasn't done totally seriously, though the concepts were serious, but we had to have a little bit of humor so people would, might remember it. And one person out of, I think, over 10, 15,000 took it. And over the years, one complains, it's gone. And you just go, wow. wow. And it can happen. And, you know, it, it's a shame that that person felt that way. Sorry, didn't mean to trigger any bad memories or anything else. But far from the truth of what that course was. If anything, we would have thought it was kind of a joke on Freud and, and Freddy fall apart, just a mess. And he's in a test suit because Freddy's trying to figure out how to fix him. Nothing was working. And that became a totally yeah. different idea for someone else. Yeah. Uh, right. And at the same time, it is amazing how much we change and, and, we, and how quickly culture changes the way we view things. Yeah. I've looked at back at a few things like advertisements. It's always fun to look at ads from like the 1950s mm -hmm. and I think, wow, that would never fly. Yeah. And, and so that, 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 that comes back to like e-learning really does need to be refreshed. Yes. And so... <laughs> Um, your example is an interesting one, but I mean, okay, that's fine. Retire it, but come back to you and let's say, let's refresh it and let's yeah. change and add a few more things. Yeah, because you could, with, there's a million scenarios you could do with that. That was just one, and they agreed to it. This went through mm -hmm. a vetting process and everybody agreed. But they didn't count on one person complaining. And, and I do wonder at that time, when one person complains and you take it down for the other 15,000, okay. Uh, it, it gets a little ridiculous sometimes, but and everybody who knew that got that why it got taken down was just going, you know. I mean, at one point, do we not develop a little bit of Teflon in this world and let things slide off? It just. I think it depends on what it is. It it does it does. Um, yeah. But that could have been dealt with in a different way, also organizationally, but they didn't. They just caved, uh, and that happens with a lot of things. It is amazing what can be conceived of as something totally different from things that, well, that yeah. were designed. And it, it just happens. It just, because you try to be sensitive to everything, but you can't be sensitive to everything all inclusive. There's so many different things to be sensitive about that it never ends. And, you know, I think people are very, very, very sensitive now about everything. And well, kind of, but then mm -hmm. I've noticed that people are not sensitive about certain things. Sure. For example, um, anything that seems to be contaminated, like, for mm -hmm. example, in, in case of corona, yep. it's like the, if you get to these primal fears, all kinds of, of social niceties oh, yeah. and, so, and social civilization just go out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's an interesting world we live in. Well, we are right. just about out of time, believe it or not. Susan, we, we're going to need to get you back on. It's been too long, and we haven't covered a lot of subjects today yet. Um, <laughs> so we'd love to have you come, come on. Maybe if you're available next week, we'll, we'll bring you back in. But um, sure. it'll, it'll be fun to, to continue the conversation. There's lots to talk about. And I have a final recommendation. So for people who are wanting a quick, easy, um, um, basically video solution and they want to create audio and, and video with their PowerPoint, go to screencastomatic.com. Many of the readers or viewers may already 
be familiar with it, but I just have found it to be so easy to use. And it's just like an instant way to create content, video and, content. And we're linking to some of the content you created using that below. So when you look at the show, take a look at the notes below in the description, you'll find some links there. Cool. That's a good recommendation. I hadn't heard of that one. Oh, it's great. And it's free. The only thing is that, that it does have ever, like its label on it created by Screencast-O-Matic unless you pay like, I think I paid $48 for the year. That's not bad. <laughs> to, to eliminate that. No. That's not bad at all. Cool. Well, anyway, Susan, glad to see you here and, and we'll have you here again. And, um, and for all you people interested, if you want to get a hold of Susan, her information will be below. And um, uh, Susan is a source of a lot of information, knowledge, and fun. She's really fun to work with. So oh, thank you. Have a good one, everyone. We will see you next week. Thanks, Susan, Harold. Um, and enjoy life before while we still have it because we're all about to be doomed according to the news. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you, Harold. We stop, right. Well, we stop with the positive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> see you next time, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.